All right, good evening. Uh, thanks for still being here and being willing to listen. I apologize, it's another talk with a question as a title and an answer yes. Uh, hopefully, the answer is more interesting than just yes. So, uh, what I'm going to tell you about is a little bit of who I am. I'm going to tell you a short story. I'm going to tell you why A-B testing might be suboptimal, because for an Android, suboptimality is what induces regret. I'm going to tell you a little bit about personalization, some of the complications that show up in our industry, and then a quick surprise at the end. So, uh, who am I? So, I'm Michael. I'm one of the stats geeks at Qubit, a statistician slash data scientist. I used to be a physicist, an astroparticle physicist. Uh, I'm an all-around boring person. The reason I'm telling you these things is because I promise there are no equations. And my goal tonight is to maintain your attention for as long as possible, but I'm going to settle for you guys not checking Twitter too much. Right. Uh, then the only slide that marketing forced me to put in, uh, Qubit is the only personalization platform that specializes in retail, travel, and e-gaming. Story time. <laughs> So this sets some context for the talk. Uh, I actually had two talks that I could have given tonight. Could have told you about Android regrets or I could have told you about regretful Androids. So because I am not a human, what I did, I split my friends, my family, my coworkers into two separate randomized groups and I measure their abandonment in the same way that I'm doing tonight with checking you guys on Twitter. I notice in the third row there's a <laughs> Twitter user already. <laughs> so, uh, Two talks I could have given, the, this isn't actually a true story. And so there's three ways that the story could have ended. Story one, I just go with my gut. Best guess, I'm going to give talk B tonight. Uh, other thing I could do, because I've done the right thing, I've segmented people into two separate randomized groups, I'm going to run an A-B test. And then I'm going to be super upset when I figure out that I've been showing a bad talk to half of the people I've been talking to. Lots of regret there. And the other thing that you can do is, if you are familiar with clinical trials, something that they do is that they run interim analyses. They run a bit of test, they check, they run a bit of test, they check. And usually these things terminate a little bit earlier, and so you can stop showing the thing that doesn't work so well a bit earlier, and so there's a little bit less regret. So, why do I have more regrets in the uninterrupted test? I just told you, let's see if you're actually listening. Anyone? Right, took about a second for people to get over their fear. So, uh, in the uninterrupted test, the reason I have more regrets is because I actually care more about measuring how bad each of the things is doing rather than about minimizing the badness of the talks that I'm giving. And I'm not actually getting any benefit from the A-B test during the A-B test. So what I care about is the quality of the audience speaker interaction that I have. And if I have a low quality interaction, that incurs regret. So what I do is I measure abandonment. Again, third row. <laughs> measure abandonment, and that's just a proxy for interaction quality. It's not actually the interaction quality. And A-B testing for this abandonment doesn't actively optimize the speaker interaction. What I have to do is I have to do all the tricks, looking at each of you individually, talking to each of you as if you were individuals. Now, by planning to run interim analyses throughout my A-B test, I'm making the following calculated sacrifices. I'm increasing my po false positive rate because I'm peaking. If you're statisticians, you know what this means. Otherwise, don't worry about it. <laughs> and I'm also sacrificing the estimate of the badness of the talk that I stop running because I've stopped running it. I stopped collecting data. My estimates of how bad it is are not quite so good. Hopefully, I don't care exactly how bad it is. I only care about not giving it anymore. And so because of these sacrifices, what I can do is I can actually optimize what I'm measuring while I measure it. So there is a trade-off that we can play around with here. On one hand, we accept that there might be more complicated, slightly weaker statistics. And on the other hand, I can start optimizing what actually matters. 
and you guys can start optimizing what actually matters. So what exactly is suboptimal about A-B testing? Exactly what is it? So let's dive deep into the anatomy of what an A-B test is. You show a variant to people at random, human sees the variant, there's some attribution model that tells you how it connects to how they respond, and then you learn nothing because you're not peaking. And then you just go back to step one, you repeat that over and over and over. Now if you had a magic android that could do better, what it would do is, instead of showing a thing at random, it would decide which variant might optimize what you care about and then show that. And then it would also, the human sees the variant, there's an, uh, an attribution model, and then you can, instead of just not learning anything, because you're peaking, you can learn from that decision response pair that you get on every user. And you can use that to make a better decision about what to show in the future. And as you loop through it every time, you're going to be optimizing what you actually care about rather than just showing random A and random B. So if you have this ML AI black box thing, it's definitely more complex and weaker stats. But how are we optimizing what we care about during the test? So if you look at the anatomy of the test, what's happening is during that first step, when you show the suboptimal variant, that's where you incur the regret. The rest of it is not regret inducing, but every time you loop through it, you get regret at that step. So what you might want to fix is you might want to quantify the regret for, per variant, right? Does it sound reasonable? Actually, you don't really want to do that because subtly if you do that, you return to A-B testing. You don't care about quantifying the regrets per variant. You care about quantifying the regret during the test, and you care about quantifying the cumulative regret during the test. So quick explanation of why the cumulative regret is what you actually care about. Uh, so beginning of my A-B test, I'm running it. I incur a little bit of regret for everyone. Running it a little bit longer, I incur a little bit more regret because I'm still showing it to a little bit of everyone. But then by the time you start making different decisions depending on what you're doing, you're actually dropping people out of the variant that causes regrets. And you see that the regret actually scales with the number of visitors to your site or the number of people that you run the test with. And so every visitor who is shown this suboptimal variant is going to increase the cumulative regret. And you measure this during the test. So quick show of hands. Which variant do you think is going to incur less cumulative regret? Anyone for A? Anyone for B? Anyone for I'm too afraid to raise my hand in public? Ah, there's one. So uh, the answer is, of course, you're not supposed to know. There's no statistically significant answer here. It looks like B might incur less because, there, actually, sorry, there's more abandonment. It looks like A might incur less, but you're not sure. So you have to balance off I think I know, but I'm not sure I know, so I have to keep running a bit of A-B test. And that's the second trade-off that you're going to have to consider here. You're going to have to do a trade-off between exploring something that you're looking at, which is just A-B testing, and exploiting what you think your best guess was, which was that first thing that we just run with your gut and you show test B to everyone. You have to do a mix of these two. And so what kind of Android should we consider in order for it to do these things? Uh, if you look at the like, names that I've given it, the MLAI black box, the magic Android, which might be better, I'm talking about MAB, multi-armed bandit. Uh, so in a multi-armed bandit, typically what you have is different arms of the bandit are different variations of the A-B test it solves an optimization problem. That's what it's designed to do. And so specifically, you minimize an, equa an equation for the cumulative regret. That's why this is the right solution to this specific problem. And as a nice feature, the way it solves it is by balancing your exploration and your exploitation. So what a multi-armed bandit does is it mixes your exploration and your exploitation. Instead of showing A to everyone or showing B to everyone, 
it does a little bit of exploration and a little bit of exploitation. And so this is definitely more complex and weaker stats. And what you can show, and there is math to do this, but I promise no equations, just an inequality here. Uh, you can show that the cumulative regret of an A-B test, I don't know if you can actually see my pointer, I get the reflection bouncing off the audience, maybe not a good idea. Uh, you can show that the cumulative regret of a multi-armed bandit, pick any multi-armed bandit off the shelf, typically performs better in cumulative regret than an A-B test. So there is, as I was hinting at, a whole laundry list of different algorithms that are going to be optimizing slightly different things. Everything that's on this slide has been researched for decades in other spaces, and you just grab it off the internet, implement it, and you have multi-armed bandit to do this sort of optimization for you. Uh, the difficulty is, okay, so you're looking for the best variant and you have lots of like, things to show, but what the best variant is might also depend on who you're showing it to. So if you think about, I have a chess game, what the best move is is actually going to depend on a lot of things. It depends on whose turn is it. If you recognize this specific position, this is a famous position in chess history, do I think that my opponent knows this is going to determine whether I play the famous move or not. Is the opposite person an android? Because then they definitely know what the best move is. More generally, the best move depends on the position of the board. And if your problem that you're trying to solve is, I want to show the best thing to the right person at the right time, well, it depends on who is the person. What do we know about the person? Are they a human or are they a computer? Because you have bots on your sites. It's great for Google. And generally, the solution to how do I show the right thing to the right person at the right time is how does the best thing, how can you personalize that? And so that's how I jump into personalization, some of the complications that come with our industry. So the realities of conversion rate optimization, it's really difficult. You have to worry about attribution models. You have to worry about people having a delay between the time they see the site and the time that they convert sometimes. You have everyone behaving differently. All your segments have slightly different behaviors and also every individual has slightly different behaviors. Your boss wants hard facts rather than statistics. And the main problem is you don't have enough time to solve for all of this. The bigger problem overarching all of this is visitors expect that personalized experience. Today in this world where Netflix tells you what you want to watch, Louis Vuitton tells you what bag you want to buy, they expect on your website that there is a little reminder of, hey, we know who you are. We remember a little bit about last time you were here. So what would a multi-armed bandit for our industry look like? Well, the model would need to be usable by a multi-armed bandit. So it would need to be an online and a predictive model. Uh, you need to account for seasonality, depending on exactly what part of the industry you're in. So you know it's a non-stationary model. You know that you need to deal with segmentation. So if you're a frequentist, you frame this as a fixed effects model. You know that you have to deal with delayed feedback. And so you know that there's going to be some missing not at random data thing happening and you have to account for that. And in personalization, it's not just a fixed effects model, it's actually a random effects model. And so when you combine the two, it's a mixed effects model. And the realities of CRO tell you, you don't have time to solve for all of this. So what you want to do is you don't want to solve everything all the time. You want to solve only what's useful and only when it's useful. And if you think back to what we were originally saying, this trade-off here, the more complex and weaker statistics, that's just a means to an end. What you actually care about, what actually matters, is what actually matters. It says it in the name. So. The real question is, will I regret not solving this specific, industry-specific problem? Because if you don't solve it, you might get a suboptimal algorithm and you might get a little bit of extra regrets compared to the best algorithm. So does seasonality matter? Sometimes, does segmentation matter? For some people, 
Does delayed feedback matter? Maybe later. It can depend on what you're trying to optimize as well. So it's still better to run a multi-armed bandit than an A-B test most of the time, but it's not always worth the while finding the best specific algorithm for the specific problem. You do like you do in any test. You check if there are pathologies that happen, and then you improve the algorithm based on actually seeing the pathologies if you see them. So surprise at the end. Uh, you can actually use multi-armed bandit to optimize your measurements too. So I've been framing this as, well, it's not about measuring things, it's about optimizing things. You can optimize your measurements. So if you look at what the anatomy of the A-B test was again, is you show the variant at random. Instead of doing that, you show whatever traffic split would optimize the measurement. And you're, you're done, you're optimizing your measurement. So there are different ways in which you might want to optimize your measurement. You might care about type 1 errors. You might say, I only care about type 1 errors. I want to optimize so that my results reach 95 confidence as fast as possible. Or you might care about fixed power. You might only care about type 2 errors. And then you say, optimize my results so that it reaches my decided power as fast as possible. Or you care about something else and you optimize whatever that is. Typically in our industry, we're mi doing a mix of fixed confidence and fixed power. And so we're typically doing something like that custom thing, but we're doing it by hand. All right, so obvious answer, yes. But hopefully more interesting, they experience cumulative regret while A-B testing. And so a couple of the messages of the talk, just rounding it up. Don't surrogate measurement for optimization. You are conversion rate optimizers, some of you. You're there to optimize, not to measure things, hopefully. A-B testing is for measuring. It's not optimization. Second statement is, well, there is such a thing as multi-armed bandit. It does solve this problem. But don't surrogate using a machine learning model for optimizing the thing that you actually care about. Using the machine learning model sometimes helps, but it isn't actively solving the problem that you're trying to optimize. And if none of these warnings matter, well, you can still use machine learning to do the thing that you were doing before anyway. Thank you.